Hello, and welcome back to the Holliston Senior Center. Uh, for those of you who haven't been here before, my name is Arthur Bergeron. I'm an attorney. I work at Myrick O'Connell. Uh, there are 70 of us at Myrick O'Connell. There are about uh, 40 in Worcester and 20 in Westboro and about 10 in Boston. And as a result, everybody gets to do what they like because there's so many lawyers that everybody gets to kind of focus on what they like. And I like elder law. I like it because I'm old and my clients don't think so. Right? To my, to my old real estate clients, I'm a dinosaur. To my clients, though, you know, I'm just a young guy. So um, these presentations are really designed to provide at least the ones in the spring, of which this is the second one, an overview to folks of what elder law issues you may want to be concerned about. And then I try to supplement that in the fall with more, with, with more specific topics. So the spring we did the first presentation and it really spoke about the elder law issues you might be concerned about, especially if you're married. <clears throat> and usually that's the only one I would do, but more and more people said, you know, that's not me. You know, I'm single, how does that work? And often folks, because I'm usually talking about my friends Frank and Mary, uh, and, and people would say, well, yeah, that's all great if you're Frank and Mary, but what if I'm just Mary or I'm just Frank? How, does, how do those issues differ. And so I really decided I'd do a separate presentation that did that. Didn't think anybody would come, but amazingly, <laughs> right, from town to town I found it's about two-thirds of the number of people would come because there are a lot of folks apparently in this category. So um, you've heard me talk about my friends um, Frank and Mary and their kids Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. And I always tell people if you're old enough to get that joke, you're old enough to be my client. And, and these folks their goal in life is pretty straightforward. <clears throat> they want to live in their house till they die. They want to be buried in the backyard. Their basic estate plan, excuse me, was that if one of them died, everything would go to the other. And probably um, everything was held jointly by the two of them. But, and so that there weren't even any probate issues. It was very simple. <clears throat> it was very simple. Um, but, but in this case, uh, you know, whether Frank was a, was a hero or Frank was a bum, at this point, Frank is a memory. And the question is, if you're just Mary, what do you need to do? So that's what we're going to talk about today. If you're just Mary, how do you deal with your ongoing life? How do you deal with death? And how do you deal with what happens after? How do you deal with what remains? So we're, going to, we're not going to make any assumptions here about their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. They may be all just angels or they may be devils, you know, they may be all arguing. And it, this, so there were, there were some things that you'd specifically want to do if there was this kind of fighting, uh, but we're assuming now that we don't know. We're, not, we're just figuring that everything is basically okay. And Mary is trying to figure out what she needs to deal with for while she's alive and then for after she dies. So first, the things that Mary needs while she is alive, right, which are the most important documents because of course after you've died, you're dead. And so you're not thinking about this as much, you know, so the main thing is while you're alive, what do you need? So, and you've heard about many of these before. You need a power of attorney, a healthcare proxy. You need a HIPAA authorization. We're going to talk about that because you're saying, what's that? Uh, and you ought to have a care plan. So you need a power of attorney because you want to make sure, if you're married, that someone's going to be able to handle your, your legal things for you if you're not well or if you can't get out of the house. You can't make it to the bank. You can't, you're, you know, you're in the hospital, whatever. And, and if you're Frank and Mary, well then typically that was just your spouse who did it. And typically all of the things you own, you own jointly with your spouse. So this issue didn't come up. But if you're single, you really need to make sure there's somebody that can take care of things for you. Now the main thing to remember about a power of attorney, the power of attorney, unless you specify otherwise, takes effect immediately at the time you sign it and authorizes the person that you're naming to handle things for you. What things? Typically all things, all legal things except making medical decisions, although you can make that list more limited if you want, right? Um, that power of attorney, you, if, you, if Mary wants, she can name more than one of her children to act together, either together in that they, all, they both have to sign documents for, on her behalf, or jointly, which is jointly, or jointly and severally, jointly and severally, which would mean that any one of her children could act on her behalf even if the others aren't around, so that you've got this flexibility. I found this is just really important for people now because kids are all over the place and they're traveling and this and that, so you probably want to have a backup. I tell people your power of attorney ought to be less than five years old. That's not because there's some kind of law that makes it invalid later. A power of attorney technically lasts forever. The issue, though, is that the person deciding whether the power of attorney is any good 
is not a lawyer or a judge or someone who's going to know that a power of attorney lasts forever. It's the guy at the bank that your daughter is going up to at the, saying, you know, I want to be able to sign my mother's checks or make a withdrawal, or it's the insurance company that she's calling on your behalf. Those people don't know, and it has been my experience that if you have a power of attorney that is less than five years old, no one questions it. If it's older than five years old, people start saying, oh, well, and this looks pretty old. So if you have an old power of attorney, just get it updated, even if you're leaving the same information on it, right? Just it's going to save you some time. Finally, um, if you have that power of attorney um, and you decide that you don't like the person who's handling things for you <clears throat> and therefore want someone else to do it, and you are therefore revoking your power of attorney because you have the right to revoke it at any time, make sure that you tell the people who are holding your money, the people at the bank, the pe your financial, your broker, all of that stuff. The reason for that is that the typical power of attorney has a section in it really designed to help out the attorney and to help you that says if that person signs a statement or an affidavit, typically just a statement, uh, saying that the power of attorney has not been revoked, that any third party has the right to deal with him without being liable for whatever happens. Okay? So, and the reason for that, and it's very beneficial to you, is that you know, if you have a power of attorney, has that section, and your son goes to the bank and says, I want to withdraw some money from my mother, and the, and the person at the bank says, well, how do I know your mother hasn't revoked this power of attorney? Well, he has now the ability to just sign something and say, well, I'm going to sign this document that says it hasn't been revoked. And you can rely on that and know you're not going to get into trouble, right? <clears throat> but for that very reason, even if you revoked the power of attorney and told the person you're firing, unless you tell the bank that, that person can still go to the bank and write a check, you know, or get money because that third party that he or she is dealing with is protected, okay? So you always want to notify those folks, all right? Uh, healthcare proxy and HIPAA authorization. Your healthcare proxy, as opposed to your power of attorney, your healthcare proxy, you can only name one agent at a time. The proxy's purpose is that, is that once your doctor has decided that you can't make a medical decision, that proxy is allowed to make medical decisions for you. And if I'm the doctor, I don't want to hear from three of your kids arguing about how to take care of you if the doctor has said you can't make a decision. I only want to hear from one person. So you can only name one person at a time. And remember that, po that healthcare proxy only takes effect when the doctor has said that you're incapable of making a decision. And like if you're in an operation. And if the, at the end of the operation the doctor comes back and says you're fine again, well then the healthcare proxy stops. Which means that even though your proxy has the right to talk to the doctor and to get information from him or to talk to the hospital, it's only when the proxy is in effect. So if you're gone to the hospital and you say it's because you're not feeling great, right? And you're in your, 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 your hospital room and you can still make medical decisions, but you want your daughter or your son to talk to the doctors because you don't want to figure it out, right? You don't want to go look at the information and stuff. Your proxy can't do that for you at that point because it hasn't gone into effect because the doctor hasn't said you're incapable of doing something. Similarly, if you, you've named one person as your proxy, but you really want all your kids to be kind of consulting on this, right? Well, only the proxy, it, it, even if it, when it's in effect, can talk to the doctor or to the hospital. That's where the HIPAA authorization comes in. So if you're Mary and you say, well, I really want Peter to be the proxy because he's close by or maybe he's a doctor or whatever, but I want everybody to talk together. So what you do then is you do a HIPAA authorization, an authorization to all your medical professionals, doctors, hospitals, whatever, that allows maybe all the kids to talk to them, right? So you do three authorizations, one to each of your kids. And that way, everybody can communicate. There's no suspicion among your kids. What's going on with Ma? How come I wasn't consulted? Clears up all that stuff. and they can talk to the doctor even if you are still competent. So it gives you the ability to delegate that and say, hey, you know, I'm in a hospital, but I just want to sleep. You know, I don't want to talk to anybody. So it allows you to really kind of handle that. <clears throat> that's the, that's the, the uh, HIPAA authorization. Now, finally, if you're Mary, I shouldn't say finally, if you're Mary, and once again, you've got your kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., you want to live in your house until you die, you want to be buried in the backyard, and then what afterwards you want to simply have your property divided up among your kids. If that's the situation and you come to me and say, 
oh, I really need a will. You know, my husband died. I want to make sure that this happens. My answer to you is going to be, maybe you don't. Because what I just described is exactly what happens if you die and you don't have a will. If you own anything that's going to go through the probate process. If you own, say, your house, and you had owned it with your husband, and you owned it jointly, so upon his death, legally, his interest evaporated. Legally, you as joint owners both owned all of the house. You didn't each own half. And when he died, your, his interests evaporated. Now you're the sole owner. So, the, so the, there are the, the probate law, which is meant to, to handle any property that you die owning in just your name, says that if that is the situation, then and somebody files a petition in the probate court, says you're dead, and that they want to distribute the property, then the court will appoint someone, used to be called the executor or the administrator, it's now called the personal representative. That person is charged with making sure your bills get paid, and so your creditors have one year following the date of your death to file claims against the estate and claims against any of those assets. Once the year has gone by, then the personal representative can distribute the assets. If there's a will, the personal representative reads the will and says, here's how I distributed the assets. If there's no will, the personal representative uses a set of rules that the state has done. They're, they're basically, they've written a will for you. And one of those rules is, if you die leaving a spouse, it all goes to the spouse. If you die leaving kids and the spouse is dead, it all goes to the kids. So in Mary's situation, if all she wanted to do was have the distribution occur that way, she doesn't even need a will. So for purposes of today's conversation, I'm going to assume that these are Mary's assets and that she's now, they're all in her name. They were in joint names with Frank. Now they're all in her name. She has a house. It's worth $400,000. she has got an IRA worth three hundred. dollars she has an annuity worth three hundred. She's got a bank account worth a hundred. She's got total assets of a million one. I know that sounds like a lot of money, um, but I wanted to use this example because later on I want to talk about the estate tax and how it affects people, and it only affects you if you have assets of more than a million dollars. So, they've got she's got assets of a million one. She's got social security coming in of two thousand a month, and per, and a pension of five hundred a month. Does she need a will? If she's simply going to divide the assets among the kids, the answer is no, right? So the question really for Mary is, is that what she wants to have happen among the kids? And does she want to take care of any contingencies? So first of all, is that what she wants to have happen? The way she decides that is by saying, does any of the kids have a money problem, have a marriage problem, or have a disability? If you've got a money problem and I leave a bunch of money to you, what I've really done is I've left it to your creditors, because now your creditors can go sue you and get the money. If, you've, if, I've, if I've left it, the money to, the, to, the, to my son and also the daughter-in-law that I never liked in the first place, and they get a divorce, now she gets some of the money, right? Uh, if one of my children has a disability uh, and is therefore on mass health or other programs that are means-tested, that, are based, that are, are, you only qualify based on your assets, then I may have inadvertently just disqualified my child by giving him this money. So you don't want to do that. So in all of those cases, what you probably want to do is you want to have that asset held in trust for that child's benefit. Because, and probably you would name, say Peter has a pro one of these problems, you would name one of the other kids, Paul or Mary Jr., uh, as the trustee for the benefit of the one who has the problem. Because if that beneficiary, if your son or daughter who has a creditor problem, doesn't have the legal right to get to the money, then none of their creditors have the legal right to force them to get to the money. So they can't get to the money. Um, if, there is a, if, if there's a divorce and they don't have the right to get to the money, the money doesn't get counted as part of the divorce assets when you're trying to figure out the split. And finally, if they need to qualify for a, a benefits program, <clears throat> excuse me, or if they're already on it, this kind of trust, a so-called third-party funded trust, does not count as an asset of theirs and therefore will not disqualify them. The money can be used to supplement their care. That's why these are something sometimes called supplementary needs trusts. Um, but it doesn't end up disqualifying them for the benefit. Okay? So the real question then, because you know even with or without a will is going to get uh, divided up among the kids. Oh, and by the way, the other contingency that if you're a grandparent that sometimes you think about is, if one of my kids has died, because now you're 70, 80 years old, that means your kids are pretty old too, right? So if one of my kids has died, 
Where do I want the money to go then? Do I want it to go to, the, to their children or to the grandchildren? If the grandchildren are young, do I want it in trust for those grandchildren? If those are issues, well, then also you need a will for that, okay? But, the, but one of the real basic questions then is if you're just married, um, how do you avoid probate entirely? Because as I've mentioned, having a will does not avoid probate. One of the most common misconceptions that people have when they come into the office is that they have a will and so they're not going through probate. Assets that you own in your own name at the time that you die, your own name individually, always go through probate, right? So, and, and why you, do you want to avoid it? Well, one, as I mentioned earlier, there may be a claim from a creditor, right? I, I have a, I do a lot of work in Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard, and, and, and in Nantucket, everybody's house is worth a jillion dollars. So I just talked to this couple, had seven kids, raised them all, everybody's happy, you know, it's all good. And they all went to college. No, I think yeah, like six of the seven went to college. And some became doctors and lawyers. And so they paid their college loans, right? But the others became artists and you know, social workers. And there's still loans out there. And the parents co-signed on all these loans. And now they've still got a debt of about $150,000 in their kids' student loans. And you know, they've made deals with the creditors and will defer the payments and blah, blah, blah. But they're, and so now they're, they're older. And they have a little cash, very little, and they've got pensions. One was a teacher, one was, I can't remember the other. But they've got this house that they bought for $300,000 in 1990, and it's now worth a million eight, because it's, it's, it's Nantucket. So I said, well, you know, as long as that house doesn't go through the probate process, right, all those creditors get wiped out when you die. Just wiped out, they just go away, right? So for them, this is really a big deal. So, it, so if you're trying to avoid creditors, or if you don't want to pay the legal cost of going through the probate process, or if you don't want the delay involved, or if you want to be able to really sell the house quickly, then you may want to avoid probate. And so how do you do that? If you're, and if you're Mary, once again, this is really a concern. If you're Frank and Mary, and you own all of your assets jointly, oftentimes this will happen. People will, couples will come in saying, I really want to avoid probate, but they're married. And, and I'll say, well, you know, I mean, I'd love to, I'd love to, you know, you to hire me and I'm glad to do the work, but you know, when one of you dies, there's no probate because one's going to die, the other one's going to become the sole owner. So really, if you want to save money, wait until one of you is dead and have the other one come in and talk to me about this stuff. So, but if you're married and you're the sole owner, well, here are the ways you can avoid probate. The, the least expensive uh, and simplest, and that's why it's the least expensive, is you either take your property and you name one of your kids with you jointly on that property, whether it's a bank account or your car or the house, any number of things. Once again, the legal consequence of that, if one of you dies, if you die, your interest evaporates, the other person becomes the sole owner. Regarding your home, the more common way to handle your home, if you're trying to do it just to avoid this probate, is that you would deed an interest in your home called a remainder interest to your children, to Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., you would keep a life estate in the house. A life estate is total ownership of the house until the moment that you die. So while you're alive, you still have, the, have to pay the taxes and the insurance, and if somebody falls down on your property, you're the one that gets sued. You know, it's, it's, it, it's totally, and nobody can throw you out of your house, and if you're rented, it's your rent, it's your income. But the moment that you die, poof, your interest evaporates and the kids become the sole owners. So the, one of the advantages of doing that is that the moment that you die, the house doesn't go through probate, right? Because your interest has evaporated. A second benefit, and probably the most common reason why people do this, um, is because of mass health. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about mass health later on. If I, if I need to, nursing home care and I want to qualify for mass health, but I want to make sure that my house is safe so that my kids still get it after I die, that I don't have to sell it, well, five years after I've transferred that remainder interest to the kids, the remainder interest is safe. Doesn't get counted as an asset of mine and can't be leaned by MassHealth. MassHealth would, if I qualified for, for MassHealth because I was in a nursing home, MassHealth would put a lien on my life estate, but when I die, my life estate evaporates and therefore so does the lien. And so the kids have the house lien free, right? There were some other benefits to it, but that's the main, but anyway, you can do that, and, and people will do that. And that is, is, a, is, is an efficient way of avoiding probate and dealing with this mass health issue. Now, there are a couple of problems with this technique, and you're just going to want to consider those. You're going to want to balance the interests here. 
you put your kids on, the, on your accounts with you jointly, and then A, they can get to that money, right? They can just go take the money out without it being a theft. They're not stealing it from you because they own the account with you. Um, B, if they have a creditor problem, then that account can be seized by their creditors, right? And C, if there's a divorce, you know, then part of that money is going to get counted in the divorce. So that may be an issue. Similarly with, the, with the, the life estate, I'll give you two quick examples of life estate problems. Uh, one, both actually happened on Martha's Vineyard. One, a lady called me because she had done this transfer. She had one child, had done this transfer to her son of a remainder interest, kept the life estate. More than five years had gone by. Now she knows her house is safe if she needs to go to, mat to a nursing home. And she calls me and said, I just want to know if I have a problem. My son just got sued for a divorce. I said, oh yeah, you got a problem, right? Because when valuing the value of a life estate versus the remainder interest, there's a, there are tables that people use. The IRS has these tables. And the percentage of the value attributable to the life estate keeps going down the older you are because the length of your life keeps shrinking. So it keeps shrinking. So by the time you're like 80, the value of your life estate is about maybe 20% of the value of the property. So this lady had a house worth $800,000. That's a small house on Martha's Vineyard, right? Um, and I told her, I said, the pro your problem is that 80% of the value of that house is going to be part of that divorce, right? And she said, is there any way out of that? I said, nope, nope, because your son now can't transfer the property out. That's one. The second, I had an, another ha similar uh, folks that had a, a summer home on Martha's Vineyard, lived in Boston, so they, they sold their house, moved to Martha's Vineyard, did this transfer to their three kids of the remainder interest, kept the life estate, they kept living along. They're still healthy now. They're in their early 80s. They want to move back to Boston because that's where the grandchildren are and because their income is okay, but they've got no cash and the house is now in Martha's Vineyard. It's worth about a million bucks. So, so they told their sons that they were going to do that because they wanted to sell their house. So in order for them to sell their house and not pay the capital gains tax regarding the house to have their exemption, their, their residential exemption, they had to have the kids retransfer the remainder interest back to them. Then they had to live in the house for another two years because to get the exemption, you have to have owned the house and lived in it for at least two years. And they, so they contacted their kids and two of them said no problem, but the other one wouldn't do it. So, ooh, so they said, what do I do? The other one won't do it. I said, there's nothing you can do. They said, well, can't we, can we sue him? Well, no, he owns the remainder interest. Well, can we force the sale of the house? Yes, there's a special process called a petition to partition through which you can force the sale. But then you're only entitled in your, to the proceeds equal to the value of your life estate, which in this case was about 20% of the value of the house. And they said, well, but what are we going to do? We can't, we can't afford this. You know, can we get a reverse mortgage? I said, yes, but all the kids have to sign on the reverse mortgage because they own, all have an interest. So, so there are cases where the life estate isn't great, right? Um, but you want to balance it out because you know your family situation better, right? And it is the least expensive. Regarding tangible personal property, other than the car, tangible personal property, technically, if Mary owns it, when she dies, it goes, has to go through probate. It never really does, ever, ever, ever. I've been doing this for 42 years now. I've yet to have a case where anybody had to go to probate to figure out how to deal with the silverware and the furniture and the stuff in the house, you know, the Hummels, forget, you know, they're not going to forget the Hummels. They're not going to keep the Hummels, right? But the point is the kids just work that out and there's no need to go to probate unless there's an item that you die owning that needs a title to it. Because if it's the stuff in the house and they have a yard sale and I go to buy something that was in the house, I'm not going to ask the person if they have a title to the toaster or to that. I'm just going to give them some money. They're going to give me the toaster, right? The only issue is a car, right? If you have a car and you want to avoid probate, you need to put the car in joint names with somebody else so that when you die, that other person becomes the owner. Otherwise, you die and the, and the car has to go through probate because someone has to be named as your personal representative to sign the bill of sale. Now, people, of course, when I say that, will always say, but it's a really old car. And I say, that's even worse. Because now you're going through probate for nothing, you know, for like a thousand dollar car, you know, that you just want to get a title, right? And it's going to cost you a thousand to go through probate, right? So take care of the car. Finally, if you're, if you're concerned about the risks involved in the joint tenancy or the life estate, then that's when people will do a revocable and amendable trust. 
revocable and amendable. So Mary will keep complete control of everything. She'll create a trust, naming herself as the trustee for the benefit of herself and her kids. And she'll say she can revoke that. That means take the property out of trust at any time. She can amend it at any time. But she's going to say right in the trust what happens to the property after she dies. She's going to say she's going to name one of the other kids as the new trustee. And she's going to say to that child, when you, as soon as I die, sell the property, divide up the money. Now, if she does that, that means, and then she transfers her house to herself as the trustee and puts that trust name on the bank accounts. The legal effect of that is when she dies, the new trustee can step right in the next day, sell the house, divide up all the money. No creditor claims, no probate court, nothing. So that's one of the more, that is a common way of also of avoiding probate. Uh, now we're gonna talk a little bit about taxes, which once again, I'm concerned about if I'm Mary because some of the rules have changed because now Frank's not around. So a couple of things about taxes. First of all, there is no gift tax. There is no gift tax. The receipt of a gift is not income. So if you give something to one of your kids, when they get it, that's not income. So they don't have to file an income tax. But also, there's nothing bad that happens to you. Could you, could, is there anybody here who thinks that if you give away more than the magic number is now $15,000, $15,000 to one person in one year, something bad happens? You heard, anybody heard that? No, you haven't heard that? That's a common myth that there's something bad about giving, giving a lot of money to somebody. There isn't. You can give as much as you want to anybody you want at any time. It has, it has a, unless you have more than $11 million in your estate, in which case there are some federal tax issues. But you know, if so it's, if you got more than $11 million, I'll call me and we'll try to explain how to deal with that. But otherwise, there's no problem with gifting. Um, now, this also relates, though, to the estate tax. If you have an estate in Massachusetts that is worth more than a million dollars and you die owning that estate, and the estate includes things like life insurance proceeds, any property that you hold jointly, everything that you control and that as a result of your death is going to somebody else is part of the taxable estate, even if it's not part of the probate estate, okay? So, let me, so I'm going to tell you just a little brief history of the, of the estate tax so you can see how the system works because there's a lot of confusion about this and I think a lot of the confusion is because people don't get the history. So in the early 20th century, uh, many states like the, United, like the United States adopted an estate tax. The idea was very much like in our current time, you had robber barons, people accumulating huge amounts and then just leaving it to their kids. And the notion was, so why do those kids, just because they got born of that family, get to have a billion dollars or a hundred million dollars, right? And, and, and although everybody else has to be supporting the government from out of their regular paycheck. So that was the idea behind the estate tax. But at that time, of course, things weren't worth that much. And so Massachusetts at that time adopted an estate tax and, they adopt, and the way that they taxed is they adopted this chart and they said from the chart how much you have to pay, and it was a graduated system, and the chart says if you have assets of below $40,000, you pay no estate tax. Above that, you did, but it was graduated. So between like $40,000 and $90,000, your estate tax was eight-tenths of 1%. Between $90,000 and like 100 or 100-something, it was like 1.6%, really low. It gradually went up. The reason why I explain the chart is the chart is still in existence. That chart still exists, it's still on the books, and it's still used, right? So that chart got adopted, and then, but then over time, what ended up happening was, especially real estate, started going up in value. So in the early 1920s, you had a $40,000 house. That was a big house, right? Not so later on, right? And so it got to be the point where everybody in the middle class, when they died, they were paying an estate tax if they had a house, because it was knocking them over that number. And so they went to their legislators, and their legislators really had two choices. They could change the chart, which would have been more complicated, or they could do the simple thing. And they did the simple thing. Why is this not a surprise, right? So they did the simple thing. What they said was, <clears throat> you know that $40,000 number that you don't pay if it's less than $40,000? We're going to change that number. We're going to say the new number is 100000 And then it went up later on to like 500000 and then six, and then to a million. So the line now gets drawn at a million dollars. If 
you have an estate of more than a million dollars, you pay an estate tax. Less than that, you don't. Okay? So then the next question is, once you've got that line, right, and over, you, over the line you pay an estate tax, how much do you pay? Suppose you have an estate of a million and one dollars, right? Well, in some states, because many states had estate taxes, they were all facing the same question. Some states, like Rhode Island, had adopted something which was referred to as a cliff tax. In Rhode Island, the magic line was drawn at like $650,000. Using their chart, at that point, you owed like $35,000 in estate tax. If you had less than six fifty, dollars you paid no tax. If you were a dollar over, you paid the entire $35,000 that you would have owed, right, according to the chart. So in Massachusetts, they did it differently. They said, we're not gonna, we're not gonna eliminate that exemption suddenly, we're gonna, we're, but we're gonna gradually get rid of it. And the way we're gonna do that is we're gonna say, if you have an estate worth more than a million dollars, your estate tax will be, you have to compute it two ways. It's the lower of the amount on the chart or 40% of all the dollars over a million dollars. So. If you're Frank and Mary and you've got, and you've got a, a state of a million one hundred thousand dollars, right? Well, this was, these are some of the numbers from the chart. So under the chart, if your estate was hundred thousand dollars, you paid a, a tax of five hundred sixty dollars. It wasn't really big. If you had a state of five hundred thousand dollars, you paid twelve thousand four hundred dollars. If you had an estate of a million dollars, and this is under the original chart, which is still in effect, your tax was thirty six thousand five hundred sixty dollars. Finally, if you had an estate of a million one, so this is Mary's estate right? Your tax is $42,640. So as I explained though, now there's this other calculation you have to do because there's this line at over a million. So if you're Mary, there's no tax if it's over a million dollars or if it's less than a million dollars. Over that you're paying 40% of the amount that's over a million dollars or the amount from the chart whichever one is lower. So if you're Mary's estate, you first of all figure out how much do you owe under the chart. There's the number. Remember we did that from the previous slide. $42,640. What is 40% of all the dollars over a million? The difference between, so it's a hundred, you're $100,000 over a million. 40% of that, $40,000. So according to that calculation, you owe $40,000. Which one is less? $40,000 or $42,640? $40,000. So in, in the case of Mary's estate, she would owe an estate tax of 40000 Now remember though the effect of what, of what just happened here. Mary's marginal tax rate on all the, the do, on all the dollars over a million dollars is 40%. So she has a huge incentive to try to get this estate below the magic million dollars. So she has three ways that she could do that. Three ways that she could do it. One. She could give it all away. She could just give it all away before she dies. Like the day before she dies. Because of course, when I tell Mary this, she's gonna say, oh, but I don't wanna give my money away. I might need the money. Perfectly legitimate point, right? But what Mary might wanna do, I'll tell her, you know, is if she's named somebody with her power of attorney, remember we talked about the power of attorney can act on your behalf. Tell the person who has the power of attorney, before I die, if I get sick, right, distribute everything. Take all the money, give it to the kids, divide it three ways. Take the house, deed it to the kids, right? Now I die and I've got an estate of zero that's worth zero. I pay zero in estate tax, zero. That's the one way to get out of it. Now, what Mary would like to do, usually, when she's talking to me is, she doesn't want to give it all away, right? She just wants to give away enough so that she can get under a million dollars, right? Now, if she does that in one lump sum, the system won't work. If she just gives away $100,000 and then dies the next day with an estate of a million dollars, she's still going to end up with an estate tax. And the estate tax is going to be based on that million dollars. And the reason for that is if she's given away money, this goes back to this $15,000 thing. If she gives away money in chunks of greater than $15,000, that money gets added back into her estate for purposes of figuring out whether she has to pay an estate tax. She doesn't get taxed on it, even though she started with a million and gave away a hundred. She's only get going to get taxed on the million, but she's going to have to pay an estate tax. If on the, finally though, if she decides, and this is another possibility, she could say to her, once again, to her daughter or to her son or whatever, 
What I want you to do is take all the money that's worth more than a million dollars, right? And give it away to people in chunks of $15,000 per person per year before I die. So in this case, give 15,000 to Peter, 15,000 to Paul, 15,000 to Mary. If we got any grandchildren, we'll give the rest to them, right? As long as every, no one's getting more than 15,000. If it gets done the day before she dies, the day she dies, she's avoided the estate tax. So there are a number of ways without getting into really complicated legal documents, yada, 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 that you can avoid paying the estate tax. And you may want to do that by giving everything away, except maybe not the house. Okay, I'm going to answer all questions when I'm done. Uh, if you could hold that question for me. Except maybe not the house. And here's why. And by the way, for those people who are yawning, <laughs> This, I, this happens to every, whenever I get to the tax part, people are going, I can't believe we're doing this tax stuff. The, 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 the moral of this story is, I want you to know the cases where it's worth doing the math. I don't want you to necessarily do the math. I want you to call your CPA or your, or your attorney and figure it out. I just want you to know that there are times where you really want to do the math. Because there's a, typically, if you're married, there's a correct answer to, the, to these questions in terms of tax avoidance. And I emphasize tax avoidance because probably nothing is more common for me, except for folks who have got immediate nursing home problem, than people who say, I don't want to pay a dime in tax, right? I just never ever, as a matter of principle, want to pay any money in tax. And so if that's really important to you, you need to do this kind of math to figure out how to minimize it. So here is a quick, quick capital summary of capital gains, capital gains 101. When Mary and Frank bought their house, if they bought it for $50,000, and then they sell it today for $400,000, remember that's the value of their house, according to the original slide. When they sold it when they were both alive, their capital gain would be the difference between that 50 and the 400. That's the capital gain. It's the difference between sale price and basis. Basis is a tax term. It means the amount that you subtract from the sale price. In, the, in this case, basis is the same thing as purchase price, right? And technically, for IRS purposes, when Mary and, and Frank bought that house, if they both owned it, owned it jointly, each of them got their own basis, $25,000, half of the 50, okay? So if they then sell for $400,000 while both of them are alive, and they, and then they have a capital gain of $350,000. Now, if it weren't their house, they'd be paying a tax on that capital gain, and it would be about $70,000. Capital gain, federal and state total, is about 20% of, the, of the, the capital gains tax is about 20% of the gain. But this was their house. And therefore, and you all know this, right? They, they're entitled to an exemption. And the exemption is $250,000 a piece or a total of $500,000. Therefore, the exemption's more than the capital gain, so there's no tax. If Frank is dead, and Mary sells the house, here's what happens. At the moment of Frank's death, his basis and his, his, his ownership of the property, his basis jumped at that moment to the date of death value, to his date of death value. He owned half the house. It was worth $400,000. It jumped to his date of death value, which was half of $400,000 or $200,000. So when Mary goes to sell the house then, she, her basis is now that basis that she got from Frank, that $200,000, plus her old basis, 25, remember from the very beginning, her basis on her half was 25, so now her basis is 225. She sells the house for four, minus the 225, the capital gain is 175. So she would pay a tax, except that it's her house. And therefore, she's entitled to this exemption, $250,000. The exemption's bigger than the capital gain, so there's no tax. The reason why you need to understand that is because if, the, if they do, if Frank and Mary do give the house to the kids and then the kids go to sell the house, unless they're living in it, when Frank and Mary gave them the house, they gave them their basis. When you give something away that has appreciated in value, there's no tax due at the time, but you give somebody, you, that person, your, your basis, so that when they go to sell it, they pay the tax, okay? So they would owe the $70,000. If, on the other hand, the house had been inherited, remember, at the moment of your death, your basis in your property jumps to the date of death value. If it's inherited and the kids go to sell it, they pay no capital gains tax. 
So that's the reason why, going back to the, to the Frank and to the Mary example, if she's deciding that she wants to give everything away in order to avoid the estate tax, that's all well and good. But if she gives it away, she's giving away her basis in the property, which means when the kids go to sell it, they're going to pay a capital gains tax. So what her, she and her kids need to weigh out is which one is better? Which one is better? Is it better to give away because I'm going to save the estate tax? Or is it better to keep it knowing I'm going to have to pay the estate tax, but then when my kids sell the house, they pay no capital gains tax? Oftentimes, uh, um, I, possibility number two is better because the capital gains rate is higher than the estate tax rate. Okay? So, Mary's other goal, we don't want to pay any taxes, I want to avoid probate, I don't want to, I don't want to run out of money. Uh, how does she not run out of money? Well, there are several things that she could do. One, she could get herself a reverse mortgage on her house because now she owns a, a $400,000 house. Say she's 80 years old. Uh, if she went to a, to a bank and got a reverse mortgage on that house, she'd get a, she would get a line of credit worth about 60% of that $400,000 or about $240,000. Now, you saw Mary's funds, what her assets. She doesn't need that money right away, right? She's got quite a bit in assets. But remember, some of her money is in an IRA, which when she takes it out, she's going to have to pay tax on it, right? And she's still got a house. So maybe she's, she just wants to know that there's some extra money that's there. That's the reason why she would do the reverse mortgage. Now, I, just, I mentioned the reverse mortgage because so many of my clients, they come in and I say the word and they're just like, no, I'll never do that. I say, well, why not, right? And they'll say, well, because no one, every all my friends told me, I don't want to do that, right? Well, why not? Well, because they're going to take my house. Well, no, no. So that's why the, you just need to understand the basics of reverse mortgage. A reverse mortgage is nothing but a home equity loan on which you don't have to make the payments. What is a home equity loan? You go to the bank, you got a house, and you say, I want a line of credit. And they say, fine, we'll take the house, we'll take a percentage of the value of the house, we'll give you a line of credit and you sign a promissory note to us, a promise to pay it back, and the promissory note says, whenever you borrow any of the money on your line of credit, we're, from that point we're gonna charge you interest until you pay it back, right? And, you, and you're gonna have to make monthly interest payments, and then as long as you make those payments, the loan isn't due until either the term has expired, because usually these have a term, like typically 10 years, or until you sell the house or you die, right? That is a home equity loan. Reverse mortgage, same thing. You go to the bank, they say, what's the value of the house? We're gonna give you a percentage of that value as a line of credit. The percentage is gonna vary depending on your age. Um, the older you are, the bigger the percentage. If you're like, go in and you're like 65, because the youngest you can get these at is 62. Your percentage is gonna be about 40%. If you're 85, the percentage is gonna be like 60%. Why? Because they know you're not going to live as long, right? So they're willing to give you more money because they're not taking as much risk. It works the same way, though. You don't pay any interest unless you've borrowed, you've actually used your line of credit. When you use the line of credit from there on in, you, there's a, you pay monthly interest. The only difference is at the end of the month, if you want to, you can make the payment. But if you don't want to, you don't have to. You don't have to make the interest payment. And if you don't, all that happens is the interest gets added to the amount of the principal, to the amount that you owe, and therefore the following month, the total amount that you're going to pay is going to be a little bit more. It's due, it, and, and, and the other difference is, as I mentioned, it is not, there is, if you fail to make any of those monthly payments, nothing bad happens. There's no default, right? So these reverse mortgages are due when you die, actually one year after you die, one year out so that your children would have one year in which to either refinance the house if they're going to keep it or sell the house and then pay the mortgage, right? And of course, the amount that is owed, just like with your, line, your home equity loan, it's simply the amount you borrowed plus the interest, right? And the only other thing that's unusual about them is that it, the payment is also due if you stop living in the house for 365 consecutive days. So if you move to assisted living or you move to a nursing home, what I always tell you or tell the kids is, once a year, go back to your house, right? Have a party, visit the house, take a picture of yourself, maybe with a newspaper, have the date on the newspaper, just so you can show you went back to the house. Now, it's not that the banks ever check this, but if you were really trying to be careful, and by doing that, you will never be in default under your reverse mortgage. So these are a great tool 
for people who want to know that, that if a, something really terrible happens, either on the house side, like the septic system blew up, you know, or there's some terrible thing, or on the personal side, like Mary wants to stay in her house until she dies, but she's going to need care at home in, if she wants to do that, and, and, the, and the reverse mortgage can start paying for that care for the person who's going to help her stay in her house until she dies. If you want to know that you're going to have that, then that's a great tool. Um, you can always defer your house taxes. If you're over 62 years old and you've lived in the Commonwealth for at least 10 years and you lived in your hometown for at least five years, um, then you can go to the assessors and say, I want to defer my taxes until I die. And they have to say yes. No matter what your asset situation is, the only limit is your income. You have to show that you have annual income. This varies by town and in Holliston it's $30,000. You have to have income of less than $30,000. But if you're Mary, in this case, that means you. That means you, Mary would qualify for this and have her taxes deferred until she died. It's exactly the same as a reverse mortgage. Exactly the same as the town giving you a reverse mortgage. Payment isn't due until you die or you sell the house. They can charge you interest. That varies by town also of between 0 and 8%. I didn't get the number when I was checking this morning because I couldn't find it on your website. So you could just check with the town. Okay, so to me, this is a great tool that most seniors don't know about, right? And for most seniors, this is one of their biggest bills. You own a house, you got the mortgage paid off. Other than food, your taxes are one of your biggest bills. So you should just know that. Um, providing to make sure that you can stay at home if you need some care. One of the best ways is long-term care insurance. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on it except to say, um, it's especially valuable, long-term care insurance is, for Mary if she wants to stay in her house. Long-term care insurance was originally developed to pay for nursing home care. It no longer, well, it does, but only if you pay a huge premium because nursing home care itself is so expensive. But the best reason to buy long-term care insurance is to buy home care. So that, say Mary is at home, she stay, wants to stay in her house, but she just can't, maybe, maybe the, you know, the kids aren't around or they're not around during the week because they're working and she needs somebody to help her make the food, right? Get dressed, do some, do some things that she otherwise can't manage. She's gonna, she can do that and there are a bunch of home care agencies that she can hire, but she's going to be paying about $25 an hour for that care, right? <clears throat> Which isn't a huge amount except if it's every day it adds up, right? So if you, say, you had, say she had a long-term care insurance policy that paid $150 a day. That's not a big policy. And then she buys it for, to run for a couple of years. So, so now she's got the, she, she can know that if she needs that kind of care, the care is going to be there. Because at $150 a day, that buys six hours of home care. That's a lot of home care, right? So unless you need 24-7 care, it's probably going to take care of you. If you do need 24-7 care, then, and you, want, and you qualify for Mass Health, and we're going to talk about that in a few minutes, um, then this can, Mass Health, if you qualify for their special program that will provide home care, will not give you 24 7 home care. They won't give you more than about 40 or 50 hours a week of home care. If you need more than that, the long term care insurance can pay for it, right? As to, and there are, there are some other programs that would be helpful regarding her saving her house, my general advice on this is. If you want, if you've got any questions regarding any of this, call them. Call Bay Path Elder Services. Have, have me, raise your hand if you've heard of Bay Path Elder Services. Ooh, about half. So the point, Bay Path Elder Services is a nonprofit organization, um, one of 26 nonprofits across the state. Each one has their own region. And within their region, they are the vehicle through which all federal and state money comes to seniors. Right? All of it, like, like the, the Meals on Wheels, the, any meals that you have here, um, ma the mass health programs, all, fu all fu are funneled through the Bay Path Elder Services because that's the entity in your region. Right? They can tell you about every one of these programs. Call Bay Path. Finally, um, if you qualify, Mass Health, the Massachusetts name for the Medicaid program, will pay for up to 40 or 50 hours worth of home care for Mary to stay at home. Now, the issue with MassHealth, and you folks have all heard this, is that there are asset limits regarding MassHealth. The asset limit is Mary would have to show, in order to qualify for MassHealth, that she had less than $2,000 in countable assets. Her house would not count, but you remember from the other, earlier slide, 
she's got quite a bit in other countable assets. So, so if, you, if you go to Baypath, and that's who you would apply to actually, is Baypath, to find out if you're medically eligible because to, for, for this program called the Frail Elder Waiver, uh, and you tell them your assets, they'll say, oh, you'll never qualify. What they won't tell you because they, don't, they can't give legal advice is how you do become eligible to qualify. First of all, to qualify for this program, there is a medical qualification and there's a financial qualification. To qualify medically, you need to show either that you need help, the physical help with at least two of the activities of daily living, there they are, dressing, eating, bathing, toileting, transferring, or that you have cognitive issues and therefore you need someone to be there all the time as a, as a, as a safety matter. Once you can show that, you can apply as long as you can show you're financially eligible. But once again, there's this issue, what if you have more than $2,000 in countable assets? So without going into detail on these programs, you've actually got three ways of taking that money and burying it, for want of another term, um, so that you can qualify for the program. You can, you can put the money in a so-called D4C pooled trust. A pooled trust is a trust that is managed by a nonprofit. There are five of them in Massachusetts for the benefit of seniors. If, you put the, if Mary put her money in the pooled trust, that money would no longer be a countable asset of hers. The day after she did it, she could apply for Mass Health and be eligible for the Frail Elder Waiver. The money in the pooled trust could then be used if she needed more than the number of hours that, that Mass Health was going to qualify her for to pay for the rest of the hours. Right? Um, now, Mass Health will have a lien on that money following Mary's death to get reimbursed. But the key to understand is that the Mass Health rate for those hours that Mass Health is providing is much lower than the private pay rate. So Matt, Mary always will benefit by qualifying for the Frail Elder Waiver. Finally, if Mary is regarding her income, if once she is qualified as an asset matter, she's also going to meet an income test, have to meet an income test. If her income is over $2,250 per month, she's going to have to also pay a deductible. Now, I'm not going to go through that. I'm not going to go through that because I, I just want to drop to one other thing. No, I guess I do want to do this. Oop. Assisted living. Assisted living. Mass Health does not pay for assisted living, right? Nor do other, most other government programs uh, except, for, except for this benefit, the Veterans Aid and Attendance Benefit. If you or your, or your spouse, even if your spouse is deceased, was a veteran who served a very short time in the military, if I recall, it's 90 days, and at least one of those days occurred during a period of war, and you're in an assisted living community, um, and you can show that, you're, that, you, that you need assistance with at least two of the activities of daily living, right, or need assistance because you have cognitive issues, then if you're the veteran, you can get a benefit of up to $2,000 a month to pay for your assisted living. If you're the widow, or widower, you can get up to $1,000 a month to pay for assisted living. Um, I, I've heard the statistic that about 75% of all people in all assisted livings across the country are using this benefit. That's one of the reasons why they're able to pay for it, because assisted living tends to be very expensive. Once again, if, you're, if you don't think you can live safely at home, but you're worried about how to pay for it, right? you want to check that out. You also want to check out the reverse mortgage. right? Because you can continue to own your home by, while moving to an assisted living. As long as you say on your application to the veterans aid and the, the veterans benefit that you still intend to return home, right? And that you're, and that you're still not sure whether you want to return home. You, so, so oftentimes people will use the reverse mortgage as well as the veterans benefit to help them pay for the assisted living. Then if they decide they really like the assisted living, at that point they'll sell their house and th therefore typically have enough money to, to, uh, to uh, stay there. One final piece, we're going to talk briefly about the look back period. If you're Frank and Mary, and Mary needs to qualify for the frail elder waiver or nursing home care, she always has the ability of simply shifting all of her assets to Frank, and she can qualify the next day. If there's no Frank, she's got a problem. The, it's the only way that she can shift assets to anybody, as opposed to putting them into the D4C pool trust or buying them an annuity, is by giving, it, giving the assets to them and then waiting five years. You've all heard of that. That's the famous five-year look-back period. Um, the way the, 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 and, and, and by the way, she's giving it to them if she's giving it to them for less than um, fair market value. 
So if you sell your house to the kids for a dollar, you didn't really sell it for a dollar, right? You really gave your house to the kids. The um, reason why I mention this is uh, that you can always do this, even if you haven't, you can just give, the, the easiest way to do this, if you've got a child that you trust, is, and you want to protect any of these assets, just give it to the kids. Just give it to them. You know, there's all this stuff about if you have to set up an irrevocable trust and do all this stuff, and that's a big legal cost. You don't have to do any of that. You just have to give it to somebody and then wait five years. If you've got an issue because you think, ooh, maybe they won't give it back, right? Or you've got a number of kids and you're kind of nervous that some of them would have trouble with this but others wouldn't, that's when you use the irrevocable trust. You, you create an irrevocable trust, name one of the kids as the trustee for the benefit of the other kids, transfer your assets to the irrevocable trust. In the case of the house, as I mentioned earlier, oftentimes people will transfer a remainder interest to the house or to the kids and keep the life estate so they can qualify five years later. Um, and I don't want to talk about those things because it's getting late. So, oh, I, oh, I'm sorry, I'm going to mention one more thing. Back to that long, the long-term care insurance. The other benefit of having one of those policies, if you own a house and you buy a long-term care insurance policy and it says that it will pay benefits of up to $125 a day for up to two years, and then, even if you use the policy, so you use a lot of those days, and then you go into a nursing home, as long as the policy is still in effect, your house is safe. Uh, it doesn't affect your qualification. MassHealth can't put a lien on the house. MassHealth has no claim against the house following your death. So it's a great tool, relatively inexpensive tool, to save the house. And for many people, that's the biggest asset. And, and so it gives... If you're Frankie Mary, it gives you the ability to do whatever you want with the house after that. You don't have to put it in a revocable trust. You don't have to do anything. You just have the house because you have this little long-term care insurance policy. Uh, we're skipping those. So if you want, if that was really, I went too fast, we, we, we bring this to the cable station and we ask them to rebroadcast them, which they usually do. So you should be able to see it on cable. Or uh, Frank and Mary have their own YouTube channel, Elder Law Frank and Mary. So you can watch this one or any one of the presentations that I do. Any questions? Thank you very much. Enjoy the summer. We'll see you in the fall. Thank you.